getting these horrible migrants um, recently. Uh. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, you guys, uh, you you have a good uh, a good a good night, and um, when you ran from the cops. When you were 24, you crashed a high school homecoming dance because you thought it was a trap in the strip club. Why, why are we bringing that up? When you ran from the cops, you ended up peeing in an elderly woman's yard. You know what? I don't like this. Well, since you guys have so rudely pulled out an embarrassing memory for me in the spirit of reciprocity, you guys should also share an embarrassing memory with me of your own. I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> I have more embarrassing memories than you could. I have a um I have some kind of thing. It's like it's like a problem and I don't know how to stop it that I will meet really famous people and i will say whatever the worst thing i can possibly say oh, to them in that more so for instance working on uncut gems i meet kevin Gar garnett and i tell him that i hate the celtics that's the first thing that i say i do this movie called reptile for netflix i meet justin timberlake he says it's great to meet you i love your work i said you know i'm really i don't really know your work very well so i can't say that i like it Justin um, Timberlake? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, yeah, I, don't I can't know, believe I, I, this. Yeah. I don't know his stuff at all. Now, of course, <laughs> Luke is not going to answer the question. No. No? no? I mean, I, I, don't have, I don't have the same level of that level of embarrassment. It's just like I'm quite clumsy and I just like drop a lot of things or I fall over. Oh. You know, have you ever fallen over my, in a public space? Especially when he's being tortured. Then yeah. he like, yes, he, he exactly. Just can't stand That's up a really straight. good segment into the episode. <laughs> yes, yes. Getting into the episode. Well, first up, I'm just curious too, just going back in time a little bit. Luke, when you were auditioning for this, did they uh, tell you that you were going to be playing like a younger version of Eric and you kind of had that in your mind or was it just young daniel that you were on no it was just young, it was just it was just young daniel i was aware of who daniel malloy was because i'd read the book but it's school and i'd always seen the movie so i was like oh this is a good part but why is he young mm -hmm. and old so nobody said anything and then when i got closer and closer still no one said anything and i spoke to rollin i think when i got the role i think rollin called me on the phone and then he told me that it was uh Eric was the one, so which was really cool. And he was and like, "Who?" And he said, "That's he not true." Because I'd <laughs> seen talk radio in the pandemic, just randomly. Oh wow! What channel it was at, like two a.m. in the morning or something? I think it was on TV, and I thought, "Oh, I recognize that guy." And then I was up till four a.m. with him, you know, watching it. So I don't know what yeah. channel it would have been on HBO, Cinemax. I mean, did you immediately after that go and just start watching talk radio and all of other? Everything no. else that Eric's done, or no? No, I decided not to, because otherwise I, w I was like, I don't want to do like an impression of him. So I gotcha. have it in my memory. Yeah. I'd seen him on Succession and Billions, and that was that. You know, he was just orbiting around my, around, around my pandemic world. But you spent time with me, and you absorbed, yeah. we, we spent time together in New Orleans, and I didn't realize that he was trying to suck my... Soul, soul out of yes. my yes. out of my yes. mouth and he was, was doing a, yeah, it and i didn't know he was just pretending like we just family. said you want to hang out want to have some breakfast and what he was doing is he was studying and is he like I, mirroring your movements and everything like I, I that i don't i don't know what he actually did but people first of all i can't tell what looks like me or doesn't look like me but but people say it's very it looks a lot like me like they're a little freaked out by it yeah. And also, you've, you've done a good job here, Luke, I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I guess you you just answered. I was going to ask you if it, it provided any sort of like identity of self to see someone try to play a younger version of you. But you said that doesn't even like process in your head that that's not really me. <laughs> I see pictures of myself when I was younger and I don't recognize myself. It doesn't look like me to me. 
Um, I don't quite know what I'm looking at exactly. Um, I always, I mean, this, you know, body dysmorphia, I have like mm -hmm. existence dysmorphia. I don't, I don't <laughs> relate to my own existence. It doesn't appear to be me. <laughs> and sometimes I don't understand, like, I don't know that things happen, like things happen to me, but I don't remember that they happen to me, or I don't, I can't imagine them happening to me. And they vary from really amazing, wonderful things yeah. to really degradation type things of the lowest, you know, drug addict order. And all of that stuff is it's it happened, but I mean, I can kind of prove it. Yeah. I don't a lot of times I just I don't feel it. I feel right now this moment. Yeah. That's about it. I but do I did have a it. great memory of doing these uh shooting this show. I don't know what Luke's experience, so much of it is a very difficult, difficult, difficult scene. So I can't, I don't know how much fun that was, but yeah. I love making the show. I love working with the people that I work with. I, you know, we don't work together. We don't have yeah. scenes together. So my scenes are all with Jacob, who's a very loving person. And in fact, Asad is also a very sweet person. But he really gets into the role, and I'm sure it was scary as shit. I don't know what was it, Luke. I'm interviewing you. Uh, yeah, let's go. I mean, interviewing each other. <laughs> this is like, like the first time we met. We interviewed each other pretty much. Oh yeah, yeah, that's how but he felt. scared you, right? I mean, you didn't know him very well. No, I met him in the first season. It was both of our first days from the first season. Oh. In when we're, at, when we're at Mary's in San Francisco. Oh, right, so we were right. both really nervous, and I turned up in my Daniel voice. I was like, I don't know these people. I'm just going to do my American voice and just leave it at that. And then, I don't know, maybe an hour into it, Adam, Adam of Byrne went up to Jacob and I. and was like, you guys are from the same place. And Jacob was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, where are you from? And I was like, uh, London. And so I had to keep up this American accent, so I had to, so I could stay in character. But they didn't yeah. realize that I was English whatsoever. Um, and so we all kind of bonded, the three of us, that we were all English. And we all got along very well. And then I think, I don't know how long it was, nine months, a year until we came back. Probably about a year. So we kind of had this sort of familiarity because we'd done this before a little bit. But, yeah. um, no, you're right. Uh, Saad was very scary. On, on at times <laughs> to, to the point like we wouldn't talk usually we have like a big camaraderie and we joke a lot but especially on that last few days with like the rest scene where he's holding me we didn't talk at all and that and you could or the 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 energy was very powerful sure. yeah i mean he's chilling in this episode makes the blood in my veins turn to ice um you know, how did you kind of, did you uh, talk about that, you know, with the Assad and the director Craig Z Z Zask before filming this? Or was it just something that you were kind of like, we're going to shoot this and see what comes comes out from the moment? It was it was a quite special um, day. I don't think either one of us knew what we were in for. And I remember that Craig had called for a rehearsal for it. And I don't know if they shot it, but Saad immediately went into it, and I started crying on the rehearsal. And we both kind of looked at each other as a double take, and it was like, wow, this is very powerful. And, uh, you know, again, like Rollins' words are amazing. And, and, yeah. And as well, and uh, we both sort of took a step back, and then we went, it was like very quiet on set, and then Craig just, just said, all right, let's go for one immediately. And we just hit it. We only did it maybe four or five times. We just, we just hit it every single time. I was very nervous because obviously it's a very emotional scene for the two of us, but mm -hmm. I, we we were I felt like we were on point every single time just because it was so intimate and difficult and we were both in it together at the same time and connected. It was it was really cool. It was it was quite amazing. And I remember in preparation the two of us were listening to music on either side of the tent and wouldn't mm -hmm. look at each other whatsoever and it really got us into a place. Um I know so I was very um he likes to keep his music to himself. I think he was yeah. classical, I feel like. I don't think it was the Spice Girls. Um, <laughs> might be wrong. Spice but, Girls. Uh, yes. But That's what you listen to. Yeah, we, 
No, I was not on that day. I was. It was. It was a Maudlin day, and I wasn't aware of a Maudlin Spice Girls song. I think I was listening to. Um, I was listening to a lot to Nico, which always puts me in a certain oh, place. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Of course, I read the script before. You know, I read the script. I, I, you get script and yeah. you read the whole thing through, including scenes that you're not in. And I got to that scene and the climax of that scene, and I was like. What the fuck? I have this is this writing is of an order that is I've never seen on television and is, is you so know up superb. there with like films and stuff. And so I was like, okay, now the challenge is gonna be are these young guys gonna are they gonna rise to the occasion? Because this is really, really, really hard stuff to do. And yeah. when they did it, I mean, you talk about the hair uh rising on your arms i mean when i watched we were watching you know earlier cuts and i was like wow they got there and this has got to be one of the saddest most resonant intense things um i have a uh it, it's very strange the young daniel parallels a lot of my life when i was young eric mm -hmm. and um and there's two. one is that as a writer I was aspirational I had no accomplishment nor any way to get to accomplishment I just called myself a writer and I didn't know how to write yeah and the other was I was fucking high all the time and I was in every crazy bar I could find so when he talks about your life is just a waste and you're just going to be a waste um this was a passage that I passed through over the next couple of years in my own personal life was that, you know, what do you think is going to happen here? Because if you think somebody's going to fly down out of outer space and save you out of this morbid, crazy life that you have, yeah. then you're dreaming. It's not going to happen. You have to find a way out of this maze. And I did. And what's also funny about this show and this character is that, this character ultimately becomes very accomplished. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I have, uh, I have a, some things, awards and things over here. And so that, that was like also part of the story. And then the, when you start the very first moments of the season one, <laughs> Daniel is just sitting around being grumpy. Like it's all over. <laughs> it's finished. He's yeah, just hanging he's out in the house. Up. He's yeah. watching TV and he hates everybody. And that's also very close to, and that's what was where I was at when I got the call to do this show. So it, the parallels are uncanny. They've, you know, it's like, okay, I guess it's all over. <laughs> Fuck you all. And um, and and so it is weird. And then when you go back to that moment that he's got there, where it's like, well, you might as well, you know, die. Just die. Yeah, you can die right now. Because it's really, your life is going to be nothing anyway. And I think that that's, um, I think everybody wants their life to have some kind of significance. We find it in different ways. But yeah. the notion that you're nothing, that you're yeah. just some kind of grease spot on the on the road, and that's all and you're we'll ever going to... And will never be nothing, anything, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. anyway, sorry to go on and on about that. But I, I and then you guys, you know... A, a tremendous respect for the, uh, Luke and Assad for pulling off. I mean, what's also really great about doing something like that is it's done. It's like there, it's, you can never, you know, it's like out of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, the moving hand having writ moves on and nothing can erase it. Well, now nothing can erase that scene. Yeah. And you should, that's a feather in your cap, Luke. And, yeah. uh, you I know, heard. yeah, I just, They're that's really the way I feel about it. Definitely. Yeah. And I, and I do think like with that scene, because obviously, I mean, previously, you were just getting put through the absolute ringer, being pummeled oh, yeah. emotionally, physically. And I think what's so, so fascinating about, you know, this whole rest speech and everything like that is that it's so tender. Like it could have very easily gone the route of you no know, Armanda's pummeling you even more and, and being condescending towards Daniel and being like, 
there's nothing, you're never going to be anything, so just go ahead and die. And it'd be like that kind of breaking. Whereas this, he really comes across as like almost merciful in how he's presenting this option to Daniel. And I just think it's so fascinating in the episode how he goes from asking Louis to uh, turn him into a vampire and live forever. And then by the end of this episode, he's doing the complete opposite where he's willing to give up his life because of what Armand has said to him. And I guess, could you kind of like walk me through the the mental roller coaster that this whole, you know, few days being trapped in this apartment has done on young Daniel here? I think, you know, obviously at the start, he just wanted he just wanted drugs. I mean, that's the whole point. <laughs> Was it know? just drugs, though? Because he seemed rather he, eager. <laughs> well, you know, if something happens, something happens. You know, that's what he that's what he was saying. But you know, he was uh, he was looking to procure something, and then mm -hmm. obviously he really tells him he's a vampire and he's intrigued by it because he's interested in the cracks of society. Then he goes into this house, and it, the start of it's like quite fun and jovial and sweet it and is it's, it's yeah. almost like it's almost like a strange rom-com in a way where like <laughs> they're doing drugs and louis showing him his fangs and it's like i don't know i, I love think... that scene by the way where you're like can you show me your fangs again yeah. <laughs> like, that's exactly that, that... what i would be doing <laughs> yes exactly and i agree and it it, it played like a rom-com in my head at the time like a sort of meet cute between the two of them. It's like yeah. they wanted to do drugs and then they fell in love. And it's like, cool. Yes. And they're going to go like walking hand in hand out of the apartment yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. Very, it's going to be cute and sweet. Yes. Exactly. I, I, I appreciated it. And then, I mean, gosh, it was such a roller coaster. We shot it pretty linearly, which helped. So Jacob and I did all of our stuff first. Mm -hmm. And again that sort of lighter tone helped you know it was the first it was the first thing we shot that season so it helped sort of like blow the cobwebs out and just sort of feel lighter and yeah. i think everyone really loved doing the 70s stuff as well because the, because the garms are fun and the haircuts are great and we just feel a lot more like i don't know like we just loose. dance a lot you know yeah. yeah it's so loose you know someone put on something that saturday night fever soundtrack or something um, and I think that just kind of like set the tone where we're like, we know it's going to get really hard and dramatic, but at least we have the sort of like joviality at the start. And then yeah. obviously, yeah. Armand comes in and well, obviously Louis attacks me. I'm out cold. Yeah. And Armand comes in and they have this big domestic fight and then it just, and it just descends into chaos. And I think it just, for me, in terms of preparing, Rollin made made such a great observation at the start he was like just treat it like an off-broadway play imagine the late 70s or 80s and just make sure it's like an off-broadway play which i know eric will love and um and that's what we did we were like okay well let's just you know let's 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 play let's let's just hope for the best and that's what we did and we had the sort of freedom to explore the set and explore the house and and sort of roam and and Craig was so wonderful when it came down to like allowing us that freedom and giving such great notes and Hannah and Roland were there and we just felt so supportive. But, it, you know, it's it's a lot and especially that those last few scenes were so emotional. But again, I really felt like Jacob, Asad and I, like we trusted each other. Like we'd sort of been through the gamut together yeah. on the front lines and... After having such a roller coaster, it was just like let's just let it all go because we know, you know, we, we've seen each other at our best and funnest and dancing and doing silly things and singing, and now we can just really like be true and honest. Yeah. So it was really, yeah, it was, it was sweet. Um, I do think sometimes, like, I wonder if Eric and I swap places and, and he does San Francisco and I sit the <laughs> you know, drinking tea with real Rashid. Yeah, I mean, uh, that getting to nice. hang out on the couch all day, yeah, not being, I, I like, like flung up on the ceiling or anything like that. Yeah, with well, that is a, that's a part of this amazing situation for me is that yeah, yeah. Uh, off when you play a role, uh, hopefully if it's constructed properly, it has to have earned beats to get to the climactic moments. 
Yes. In this case, I didn't have to do any work on the earned beats. He did all the earned beats, and then I just had to reap the rewards in the future as I'm I become aware of it all. I mean, I have to say, that's not entirely true, though. Like, you are doing quite a bit of work as well in the present day, you know, showing... Because I, I love how the whole episode is constructed. We don't just, like, go to the 70s and witness it all play out. It's very much a play between Daniel and Louis of, okay, we've got this opportunity. Armand is away. There's, like, this ticking time bomb element of, like, we have to uncover truth before he gets back. And you're pushing Louis. He's pushing you. And I do think that, like, scene at the end of the episode where you come to realize that, like, your whole life and the pursuit of being a journalist has essentially been brought on by the power of suggestion. And it's like, there's this man, he's at the end of his life, nearing the end of his life. He has Parkinson's, you know, he's, he's dying and coming to realize that like everything he's built himself upon is kind of a lie based on what happened this night in 1973. And absolutely just like, broke my heart into pieces when you have that realization and you kind of break down and cry and you know saying i've i've destroyed two marriages i've fucked up two daughters and what was it for well so. it was a thrill to shoot that stuff and um uh again you got great writing rollin has a tremendous sense of dramaturgy um and of course, I'm known for all my teary scenes in all the show movies and things I do. Yes, you you're a very see. weepy, weepy man. <laughs> I'm the Meryl Streep. I'm a male Meryl Streep. Yes. I cry in every movie. I'm <laughs> Meryl Streep. Yeah, yeah I've, I've never, I've never done anything like that actually. And um, it was great to get guided into those moments. Um, and you know, it, you know, I do this thing that I do. Uh, for one part of acting is just fun. It's enjoyable. I, it's been always fun for me. I started when I was a kid, but, um, but I do want to keep doing new things. I want to learn new things. I love being around actors who have some skill set that I'm not, I don't know how to do that. It's like, oh, okay. Um, so another one, I'm doing things that I haven't done before, as far as I can remember. And the, the other thing is that Jacob as, Luke just explained, we were dealing with a very safe set. Um, you have to be in an unsafe set to know what it means to be in a safe set. If you're around a lead who is incredibly selfish and actually trying to undermine your scene every time the camera's on you, it's very stressful. And I've been in those situations a few times. I've mm -hmm. literally had actors uh, spit on me during a scene when they weren't supposed to. Uh, it wasn't in the blocking or anything. Just they decided that they'll, they'll throw that in to just drive me even more crazy or stand yeah. in front of me in the lineup so that I'm always the camera. I can't get into the shot. Um, but the, the opposite is true with the people on this show. Uh, certainly, Jacob is very, very, he's so there that it makes your job a lot easier because then you can go there too. And then you like are yeah. there together. And and I, I, I don't know other people's experience of acting, but for me, it is about fantasy and about pretending. And I want to completely immerse myself into that other guy, even as mm -hmm. close as Daniel might be to me, we're not the same person. So I, yeah. I get to be Daniel. And if we can really pretend to be totally in Dubai, 100%, uh, it's an experience. The thing about me is, though, and this is another consistency with our cast. I don't, I wouldn't expect it in those scenes that you were talking about, Luke. But we tend to drop. Uh, we walk off set and we just go back to being ourselves. We go back. We have a snack place that we go. We eat some snacks and we hang around. We joke often. <laughs> well, Jacob can be annoying because he plays really loud music. But other than that, I mean, people I really like are, his choice of music. I, I, I got it. It was great. So we oh, you like, run. see, you guys are more in the same, but I'm not there. You know, what, I don't want to hear it. We like the same music. Well, he's very, I like the same music. I was going to say, what kind yeah, of music you, is on your playlist, Eric? What are you jamming music? out to? Yeah. 
Well, I don't, I don't tend to jam out that much, but I guess the most sophisticated thing I've been listening to lately would be Queens of the Stone Age or something like that. I'm a more metal guy, so it would be something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and occasionally I venture down some, I don't know, you know, Lord or something like, I don't know, something completely oh, wow. different. Yeah. But that, otherwise, but no, no, focused. Justin, no, Justin Timberlake though. That's no, not on the Justin, no, no one named Justin is allowed into my entertainment world. <laughs> <laughs> All the Justin Hard line in the sand. No, Justin, the thing about Justin, you know, well, Justin, no, Thoreau, Bieber, no Timberlake, no, B, no, <laughs> yeah, it's That's a generational. It. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm actually I, I listen to Beethoven more than I listen to anything else. But um, <laughs> so refined, showing us all up. <laughs> wow, it's it's not that I just I think Beethoven is smart. Beethoven's cool. Anyway, yeah, this is a, yeah. What Beethoven's cool? Beethoven's cool. Yeah, it's cool. I get it. Something you don't know, Autumn, is that Luke is extremely sophisticated about music because he comes from a musical family of sorts, and so he's been exposed to every. You know more, way more. Sound like one of the Osmonds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you have a band though, right? I did find that I in my research. Band. I do have a band. Yeah. 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 Is that how does that kind of, you know acting versus like making music does it you know tickle different parts of your brain or how yeah. did that come about for you it really just i was going through a breakup a couple of years ago and it was pretty awful when my friend who's a musician was like hey come over and i've written these songs and just improv over it so it's kind of kind of similar to like improvisation and comedy and just like got this emotional release it was just uh uh it was important it was uh, cathartic and then we just kept writing music and now she plays with Morrissey. I lost her to him. So, um, what? No one else here. Yeah. She's in Morrissey's band. So we're not making music at the moment, but hopefully when, uh, when the Moz father is done, then I'll get her back. You'll get her back and then yeah. write a song from the perspective of young Daniel. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Here's, here's that. one that you would never imagine from this old guy that's got the headphones on in this image right now. I used to open for like, I don't know, Flipper or Mission of Burma or Sonic Youth or, you know, I was around that world, the club world. Uh -huh. I toured with the Rocksteady crew in 1982. I mean, it's a whole other part of my life. A lot of nice really? clubs. A lot of places where the dressing room is like every mirror in the dressing room is broken. That's pretty much the description of a punk, the you know, yeah, yeah. dressing yeah. room. If there's even any shards left on the wall, then there's all this spray paint and everything all over the place. Anyway, that was some, um, you know, nightlife kind of thing was happening. I mean, that was the first thing I remember talking to Eric when we went on our walk in New Orleans. Um, we had a long discussion about No Wave because you were very much. Oh, yeah, no yeah, yeah. Scene. That was a big effect on me. Yeah, the, the, the first No Wave concert was across the street here. And it was like the contortions and teenage Jesus yeah. and the jerks and all, all these yeah. DNA, these guys. Yeah, no, and yeah. we were around all of that. So and it was this tiny place as big as this. So I don't know what happened to our eardrums that night, but the contortions had a big effect on me and a lot of people. He was an amazing, uh, you probably don't even know who I'm talking about, but yeah, this was, out. yeah, yeah. And then, and then out of that world, Sonic Youth rose up out of all of that and kind of took all these elements of this discordant music and made it into this genius thing between Thurston and Kim and Lee is incredible. So there's a music component to my life. Yeah, I would yeah. listen to Sonic Youth all day long too. I mean, I would, I'd put that on all day long. And, uh, but I'll also listen to, uh, I don't know, Biggie doing Juicy. I don't know. I think that's one of my favorite <laughs> songs ever. <laughs> Putting that... In the thumbnail. Well, I relate. I, re I relate. That is the I thumbnail. Relate. I relate to eating the sardines out of the can. Um. <laughs> I'm like just seeing this vision. Okay. Go with me here, guys. A new band called The Daniels. <laughs> yeah. Both of like you together. It. Eric revisiting yes. his past. Luke I come out in, in a wheelchair. <laughs> I come out in a wheelchair, a little bib on for my How drawer. How would that be, though? I mean, who's doing that? <laughs> I like that. 
That's good. I think we're onto really cool. something here. I could roll if you're in the if, yeah if you're in the wheelchair, I can roll you in. That's that's and we use it as an instrument. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you could have yeah. like a little stand on the back of the wheelchair too, like you're kind of yes. on it as well. It's almost like, like a like tandem getting. bike, but it's a, a wheelchair. That's cool. Yeah, it's 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 Sonic Youth meets Beethoven. I like it. Yes. Hey, yeah. yeah. Well, Someone's Frank off to the side, you know, jamming away at the grand piano. Oh, that's another exactly. band that I love. System of a Down, of course, I think are that's the some genius there too. I think System of Downs I've been listening to the late most lately because I uh, anyway I won't tell you why, but anyway that's why <laughs> somebody I didn't offend. Surge. Okay. I did. I didn't offend Serge. I think. I think I mentioned not. I think that he's. Bridge. I think he's a good person not to offend as well. I, I would not want to be on his bad list. <laughs> I introduced Soundgarden at Madison Square Garden one night when they were opening for Guns and Roses, and I was completely obnoxious that night too. I said, <laughs> "Okay, I mean, you get this full stadium." of kids bridge and tunnel kids who've all uh -huh. and i just got out there and i said okay kids you have your bandanas on you've borrowed mom's car you're here to see guns and roses here's a better band and, and which was really oh, wow. about the most offensive wow. thing you could possibly say oh my <laughs> god it, it, Adding that did to you the have any <laughs> did you have an altercation with axel or slash afterwards they didn't give a shit and actually, and I don't, it's one of those things I actually don't believe it. I think they were uh, on par with each other. It's pretty. And then I stuck around for when Guns N' Roses started their set. And I mean, welcome to the jungle on a roadway, uh, a, a path, uh, what do you call it? A runway going down through the, it was, it was the best start of a concert I've ever been to. It was Talk about hair raising. Anyway, we're going to do sit around talking about I great concerts I went to. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the episode, though, <laughs> I, I do have like a nuts and bolts questions for, you know, filming the scenes in the apartments and everything. When you're forcibly squatting in front of Armand, are, is that wires? Are you on a chair that's like green screened out? How did they, how did they do all of that? There was a chair. Okay. The, the, it's wires that's pulling me and then the sitting motion is like the smallest thinnest chair that you could imagine which also still took a lot of energy in hamstrings and thighs and um it was painful it was Legs were painful actually as, cramping oh yeah. big time yeah big big time and also the wires are very uncomfortable they stick this harness in you and i'd had some I'd done some wire work in the flash, but like this was very intense and uncomfortable because they really jerk you on it. And um yeah, certain parts of you, you know, go at certain times and it's it's a lot. So but it looks amazing because I didn't know how it was gonna be and I was like, this is a very silly little thin chair. Like, what are we yeah. gonna do with this? And um it looks amazing. So Yeah. Were you covered in bruises the next day? from just being flung around? Yes, there was, there was. Production was very good though, because in the hotel, they were like, have a massage. And I was like, okay, sounds good. So it was, it was a regular occurrence. It was very, very nice. But yeah, it was very, very physical and, uh, and hard, but you know, it's a hard not right. You know? Yeah. Uh, Eric, are we gonna see you get flung around at all yes. in the coming yes. episodes? please. <laughs> <laughs> they get me off the couch eventually in the last episode <laughs> okay it's, it, it's pretty entertaining uh, out of the <laughs> dining room away from the desk off the couch out of the well i do you've already seen me leave the um the, yeah. the apartment because I've but you're to still sushi, sitting down at a bar. bar yeah yeah i do like the sitting down scenes it's more my I mean, thing top notch uh, yeah uh, yeah um i don't know i mean if we go to another season then who knows what's coming i have no idea um Obviously, if you follow the Anne Rice books, mm -hmm. we've already veered off into unknown territory with Daniel exactly. Malloy. Exactly, yeah. didn't yeah. exist in the books. And a testimony to uh, Rollins um, and, and Hannah's great imagination, uh, imaginations. I don't know what's coming, and I'm re I have never felt so safe in, in the hands of uh, showrunner producers, so... 
I'm ready if they if they decide they want to keep going with this madness. I'm all uh -huh. for it. Uh -huh. I mean, right. I think that's right. part of the. You know, it's funny to work on a show that's so authentic with such great writing. The beats work; they really work, which is a big part of acting. And then I'll watch other shows, and I'll watch actors trying to sell cliches. And I admire them for it because it's mm -hmm. what you're doing most of the time. You're selling a cliche, but you don't get to do original stuff. Or you're doing, I mean, you know, like Luke has done both kinds of things. I have not done superhero stuff, but he's done superhero. Superhero is its own realm. I mean, you've got yeah. you to swing with that. But if yeah. it's supposed to be a, in, a interpersonal relationship thing and it's just hitting all these cliched beats... You know, my my favorite is in uh, the uh, Fast and Furious movies when he's talking about we are familiar, yeah, we you know. And I think, wow, he sells that shit. I believe it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Uh, Vin Diesel, very skilled at selling malarkey, but it's it's hard to do that. But if you get to do scenes that are really grounded, and in this case, grounded in, you know, it's obviously a fantastical world. And yet, I mean, it feels really real when we're in it. We believe all these things. Uh, yeah. This, this world, I, I know Jacob is totally, I mean, everybody's totally subscribed to their characters, which... Uh, that's pretty cool, fun stuff. So then then from that, I'm saying, okay, what else have you got? I'm ready. Let's do it. What do you, yeah. what do you want me to do? Uh, okay. And if it, does, if it does involve physical stuff, I've always done physical stuff, and I kind of like it. It's, it can be a lot of fun. Sometimes it verges on dangerous. You want to believe that somebody's going to stop it if it gets really dangerous. Um, yeah. The end of Uncut Gems really went over the edge and they were kind of freaking out but keith and i were having a good time fighting there was glass real glass breaking real eric breaking uh but um <laughs> and keith generally i don't know if you've seen uncut jump but at the very end he is one scary motherfucker i'm having lunch with him tomorrow i have some people i need to have killed and so i'm going to ask him if he can just go visit them and kill them for me gotcha man I got. I got to get into your phone book. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime. Okay. Okay. I well. So we're talking about the future and everything like that in the seventies. You know, Armand does make the you know comment that he's been calling to Daniel for some time now. So he's been aware of Daniel, which also makes me kind of question: Was it coincidence that Louis and Daniel ended up meeting in the first place at the bar? And we know, obviously. Daniel is released back out into the world. Is this the last that we're going to be seeing of a uh, young Daniel of Luke on our screens here? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, you know, if Eric wants to do more action stuff, I'm happy to s sit on the couch or uh, or in a restaurant or uh, to get married or something. Who knows? Or I, I would. I wouldn't somebody. try. I wouldn't try to second guess the the sh the people who are writing this show, but no. they've already established a bunch of stuff about my fucked up marriages and stuff. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I, I mean, if we ever went back and looked at that, like the the whole thing about the ring and Paris and all that junk, clearly it yeah. wouldn't be me doing it. It would have to be Luke doing it. And I would love to see that stuff. I would love to see that stuff with him in the scenes with the wives or the wife, and then I'm there somehow. Somehow I've time traveled, and yeah. I'm you know maybe maybe that's something vampires can do too. And I get to <laughs> I get to like be lurking in the background, watching that moment that was so pivotal in Daniel's life. I like that very that, meta. Yeah, I like that's, a, a life in time according to two different perspectives of Daniel, the live version, which is the late 70s, 80s version, and then you now commenting on, like, what you did wrong or what you would change or how you can change it. That's, and that's, would, that's I mean, this, these get into deeper questions that Anne Rice is sort of implying, like, okay, you don't want to die, but do you want to live forever? Like, what would that mm -hmm. mean? And she's always yeah. exploring that. Likewise, you don't like the way things turned out in your life. How would you change something? What would you change? Uh, you have an ex-wife who isn't speaking to you anymore. Yeah. And you find a way to get her to start speaking to you again. Maybe go and hypnotize her or something. I don't know. I mean, 
I don't claim to have the imagination. Good, good to... basis to a good relationship moving forward. Just hypnotize yeah. her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have her completely under my control. That mm -hmm. would be actually that's what we all I mean, want in a relationship. We're kind of seeing that, and you know, with Louis and Armand, Louis and Daniel, and everything. Yeah. Currently now, yeah. already playing out. It, it already is reflected. Yeah, for sure. Plus, it's just great to see, like, you know. Uh, young Daniel and possibly the different hairstyles he'll have in the in the 80s oh, like I yes. always I, I Eric I've seen pictures of your mullet and I you know and I'm <laughs> waiting if, yes. there is, if there's another season and it includes there <laughs> I want to have the full Bogosian mullet so we need, we I, need I the it. mullet I know it exists <laughs> it wasn't a mullet but it whatever it was yeah it's okay it was yeah I it was, I it was, it was like, a yeah. look for sure. It was a curl. I can do it. So uh, okay. I think it's cool. <laughs> this, isn't I mean, that, does... this isn't that bad. Come on. No, it's not How bad, bad is that? <laughs> it's a, it's um, a little furry <laughs> for our time. It's, but... No, it's, but it There's definitely, the I've seen some photos it's... with a little bit more length to the back as yeah, well. Yeah, I know I exactly what Luke is talking sure. about. Under, under Siege 2, I think there's length to the back. <laughs> Not that, you know, not that uh, I know. we can laugh but anyway. now. <laughs> but I do want to see that. So I'm going to write to yeah. Roland after this uh, and be you, like, you, you got to put a New mullet York, into, this, into the script. When you visit New York, come by here at the office and I'll, I'll show you the archives. Okay. All right. That's, I've got that verbal contract. I'm going to come visit Eric when, next time I go to New York. Right. So in this episode two, I mean, the whole bombshell of how this is revealed is from this outside source, this mysterious Mr. Ragland James. I mean, what does Daniel think of him in this moment? He's using his resources that he's passed along to him, but does he trust these resources? No, but um, it, it's kind of like the Trump trial that just happened. Whatever these facts are he's putting in front of me, what would the alternate facts be if these aren't true? Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the other story? I don't I can't figure out what the other story is. I also don't really know who these guys are, but I'm looking at things and, you know, let's take, for example, a newspaper article that gets sent to me as part of the archive. Well, I can go and find that real newspaper article and find out whether it's real. I And I do, in fact, go and chase down some of these facts uh, mm -hmm. about the theater burning and all of that stuff. So um but i don't know what he is um but that's my world my world is a world of unknowns and and everything is a mystery that has to be figured out and it's it's what i, I shouldn't say i daniel so daniel this is his job is to crack mysteries and i think he's so built for it that he almost can't resist it kind of like as they say what happens when the when the dog does catch the car well the mm -hmm. dogs are always running after cars they can't help themselves and that's what yeah. he's doing he's chasing the car what happens when he catches it i don't know if he really has figured out what's going to happen and in fact that will be uh some part of the end of the season is some car catching going on and when that happens it is really perplexing how you get out of this mess because it gets things get very crazy and but I won't I won't I can't, I can't obviously I'm not allowed to talk yeah in no in the broadest terms and you haven't seen it either right you haven't no. seen the whole season yet no yeah, I've only I mean, seen up to episode five so I don't even know what happens oh, really? in the next episode yeah I don't oh, know oh, okay well yeah. as dynamic as the season has been it will continue to be dynamic I really I dynamic cannot they wait. are they're good these guys they're very good last little thing here too i guess now that moving forward does daniel feel like louis is kind of more on his side and he's gained some allyship in figuring out the real story here there's definitely a turn it starts to happen in that i think it's the second episode of the first season uh, uh, this season uh, either the first or the second episodes where he goes there's a look on my face of true true concern and i go would, do you need a break? Mm -hmm. And it's clearly where, you know, the whole like super ironic approach I take to every single thing he says, where it's like, I make some snide remark after most of the things he says, 
I stopped doing that. And then that means that we have to be moving closer to each other. If I have any empathy for him at all, not, yeah. a, I mean, it's a dangerous thing to have empathy for this particular character because as uh, Raglan says, you're afraid of this one. You should be, he's not the one you should be afraid of. Yeah. And there is volatile. an aspect that, you know, Jacob understands and, you know, it's like the scorpion and the frog story or whatever you want to, he is still a vampire and he's still really dangerous but we have met somewhere in the middle and we'll we will continue to try to find that spot it's not an easy place to live in for us there is a lot of distrust and it's going to stay there is distrust and also this show has been all about you know thinking you know what's going on and then find oh no it's not quite that it's this and then there's another layer and another layer and i and i have a feeling this will just continue forever it, yeah. I don't think it ever stops. And and that is also reflective on the Anne Rice stories where she she keeps playing with who is in charge with her characters and she creates these very elaborate backstories, particularly, I mean, Armand is one of the most elaborate backstories you can have. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and that informs everything he does. Like you can look at, you know, you could say PTSD or you could say, just crazy fuck. But either way, <laughs> he's he's he was abused and he's doing bad things. Um, yeah. And also, too, I mean, she just plays so much not only with character and who's telling the story, but just as time goes on, how even, uh, you know, you think of something as a vampire, they don't change through time, but they really do through her books. Like each book, they kind of come to different conclusions at the end of it especially like her conversations with like what happens after death and what does immortality really mean and i just think that's such a fascinating element to her story i mean with claudia how... particularly claudia's yeah. changes are fascinating to sit and ruminate on and remember the first time you see jacob in the in the very first episode he's pulling a knife on his brother i mean mm -hmm. uh it's it, it, this guy has got some some stuff up his sleeve that's not he's no sweetie pie <laughs> even though he looks like a sweetie pie he sure and does he, and, and he is a sweetie face pie. of an angel See, jacob looks <laughs> like and jacob looks like a sweetie pie he is a sweetie pie luke looks like he's a sweetie pie and he's evil incarnate but that's wow my oh, experience wow. with him directly wow. under yeah. the bus yeah. what do you say when i'm not here <laughs> is he a sweetie pie <laughs> Do you have any harsh words for Eric, Luke? <laughs> yeah, he's just, uh, he just listens to Beethoven, I get it. Yeah, I don't know, Eric. He's coming off as pretty sweetie pie to me. <laughs> yeah, see, that's it. He's, you're already following un into his trap. His the hypnosis has begun. <laughs> when, is that flight, when is that flight to Colorado, Luke? When are you going? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Tomorrow. I don't know. You booked it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Going down the river together. Great high water. We're going to be rafting. You're coming too, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The cheer. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Here is to Eric and Luke, shot through the heart by your performances as Daniel in Interview with the Vampire. Cheers, guys. Uh, Thank you so much, guys, for chatting Thank with you. me. I look forward to our uh, world tour coming up soon. I'll see you in New York when you okay. come by. Sounds good. Right. I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. But also <laughs> have this, you know, I think diving deeper into it, you know, it's like things you could be tied off to or um mm -hmm. you, you know that yep. that it's Picked like up on that. That, <laughs> that it's like and it's that little bit of sexuality you're talking about there exactly